present tonight. And with that, Tom, um, I'll turn it over to you. I don't know if you want to introduce the players sure. to the conversation. Or sure, we have like uh, some guests with us. Uh, we're going to try to give you kind of a global, well, start with global, then a regional perspective, and then really what it means for the town. So we've got uh, folks around the table. Why don't we start with introductions? I think everyone knows, yeah. but for the public's purpose. Right, good evening. I'm Mike Shaw, Public Works Director. And, okay. Kevin Roach, General Manager of EcoMain. And Jamie Fitch, Sustainability Coordinator for the town. So, as, uh, as Tom alluded to, we're, we're here to talk about recycling. Uh, we're pleased to be joined by, by Kevin, uh, who uh, is, the, as he said, the general manager of EcoMain, of which we are proud to be uh, a member community and owner. Uh, Kevin is going to spend 10 or 15 minutes or so kind of giving us the, the, uh, the market, market report and also uh, the EcoMain perspective and, and uh, start drilling down to why we're here today uh, to discuss uh, the economics and of, uh, of, of, of recycling and the, the, the new realities, at least for the time being. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, Jamie will give us uh, 10 or 15 minutes of more Scarborough specific, bring it closer to home, and then uh, should have about 15 or 20 minutes for uh, um, any questions that you folks might have and clarifications and that sort of thing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Great. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've always appreciated um, Scarborough's engagement and involvement in EcoMain. Uh, many of you have been on our board of directors. Many of you have helped us out with, uh, with policy issues, um, and um, both the elected uh, staff and, and the staff as well, and the elected officials uh, have always been very helpful. To, so thank you for that. Um, I just kind of wanted to open up with um, the kind of the big picture and, um, and maybe have uh, a little bit of background. Oh, slide the other way. The other way? Yeah. Oh, you had it. Then. I had it on for okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Too efficient. But for those of you who may not be as familiar with, with EcoMain, um, we are a quasi-municipal organization. We have 20 owner communities in all. We have 73 member communities. Um, I've stated our mission statement there, which you know really focuses on a balance between being safe, environmentally responsible, and economically uh, sound. Um, we do subscribe to the waste hierarchy, which is in state statute, as well as guidance from the EPA, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle first and foremost, and then compost and digestion, waste to energy, and landfill. And we have we we, we really use that at, in our integrated solid waste management policy. Um, uh, when we make, uh, when we're doing decision and, and policy, policy making. There's our owner community, so we stretch just across um, the southern border into New Hampshire. We have a couple of New Hampshire members, um, and then all the way up um, to Stetson and Glenburn and Carmel, and Newburgh, west to Andover and Freiburg. Some of those communities are recycling members, some of them are solid waste members, some of them are both. So it's really a mixture of whatever the needs are of, of these individuals communities. Um, we have, we own and operate three, uh, three facilities um, being the single sort recycling plant, the waste energy facility, and a landfill. And of course the landfill is partially located <coughs> in, the, in the town of Scarborough um, and in the city of South Portland. And then we also added a food waste recovery program um, two years ago that's uh, functioning quite well as, uh, as well. Um, Programs, we really, I think what really stands us apart from money, many other agencies that are similar to, to us across the country um, is our, um, our commitment to outreach and education. So we try to be everywhere. We're at the fairs, we're at the festivals, we're in the schools. Um, almost on a daily basis, school groups, busloads of students are coming to our facility and touring our plant because um, we feel that if you can spend an hour with us, um, you really, you take away and become an advocate for good solid waste policy. So often schools are coming in and it might be the sixth grade and every year we recycle those sixth grade students and so those sixth graders are coming to us every six, so that we, yeah, we hit each and every one of them. Um, in addition to that, obviously so social media, um, TV and radio as well. Um, this is just kind of a fun um, slide here. Have you ever wondered about those Ruffles potato chips that you threw away 50 years ago? Um, if you're anything like me, you, you do ponder these kinds of things. Um, or how about those newspapers, you know, from 45, and, uh, 45 years ago? Um, we wanted to find out what was happening with those materials, so we, digged, we dug down deep into the landfill, 
And what we found out was we found some interesting things down there. And this is, uh, I showed this to my eight-year-old son. He couldn't figure out what it was. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I should have kept this around, um, a Purple Rain cassette. Yeah. Um, so what, my point here is that landfilling really is a, a forever storage mm. solution. Um, yes, you get degradation in landfill because landfills, in my uh, opinion, are, are one of the most, if not the highest, emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, and so um, you are getting, and that's because of the degradation, but what we found was a lot of the material, depending on the circumstances that are happening underground, um, uh, you know, a lot of that waste is preserved. I didn't show a picture because it's almost dinner time, but we actually found chicken breasts that were 35 years old. Um, oh had the package, had the date, they were from Hannaford's, and they actually looked pretty much like chicken breast. So um, this is actually a landfill. This is the largest landfill now. It's in Seneca Falls, New York. It's the largest landfill in the Northeast. And this is what it looks like. I mean, they queue up eight lanes wide, tractor trailers coming in, you can mm -hmm. see, um, from all over the Northeast, um, lining up to dump garbage in this landfill. So. Um, you know, land, for us, it's all about landfill diversion. Um, the fact that we have a landfill that's still located two and a half miles from the city of Portland, um, again, makes us unique um, because most cities this side, not, not that we're a large city, but most communities this size are, are transporting their waste to far away rural places because mm -hmm. they don't have the capacity um, that close uh, by anymore. Obviously, nobody wants a, a landfill in their backyard. And I'll take you back 31 years to Mobro, which was the garbage barge. And New York kind of thought the same thing. New York City came up with this wonderful idea that they would ship um, their waste um, to other places. And um, it sounded good, but this barge basically left um, uh, New York City or Long Island and um, traveled down the East Coast. They were going to deposit the waste in North Carolina until the media got a hold of it, and um, that was the end of that. They traveled for seven months mm -hmm. in the Gulf of Mexico, eventually to return to New York City to be burned in a waste energy plant. So the message there on the barge was, next time, try recycling. And really, that was the re beginning of the recycling and the waste to energy movement. That, that this was in the late 80s, where uh, local dumps were being closed left and right. They were not environmentally sound, and um, we needed to come up with another solution. So we began our recycling programs. Often they were drop-off facilities or they, those that were doing curbside collection. It was a manual process. You can see oftentimes there were two or three laborers on the side of trucks sorting and separating all the different types of recyclables. We started with newspapers and then we added clear glass and brown glass and tin cans. These trucks became trains and it became so inefficient to collect these materials because these trucks were sitting on, at the curb for about three or four minutes per stop and um, the trucks running um, and of course you know the, the impact the environmental impacts of that so we really needed a more efficient way to collect recyclable materials which is why we transitioned to a single sort recycling program which the town adopted um, and 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 that's where we are today where the recyclables are collected the driver doesn't even get out of the truck anymore, as you, I'm sure you know. And it's a very efficient stop. It's basically seven seconds per container. Wow. So you compare the seven seconds per container, so it's 14 seconds a stop. And then, of course, there's a drive time between the stops. Um, but much more efficient than the old-fashioned way that we started with, with doing the, the, uh, the curbside sorting. So that brings us today, um, and we've had a really good run of our recycling programs. Um, over the last 10 years, prices for recyclables have, have been pretty steady, and you can see there, it, uh, it, it, you know, from, for, uh, from 2008 on to about 2017, and then um, in, in 2018 is when the market crashed. And so really it's presented a new set of challenges for the recycling industry. Recycling is not dead. It's alive. It's well. Um, but it's not bringing in the revenue, particularly from post-consumer materials um, that it used to. So why? Um, why did this happen? Well, I, I list three things, uh, three really variables that impacted this. First, uh, supply and demand was thrown out of balance um, because China pulled out of the market. Um, and I'll get to more of that in just a couple minutes. But it's not just China. Um, it really is other variables too. Um, a big, huge variable is newspapers. Newspapers drove recycling programs um, for the you know for the last 30 years, 
and um, we began to see um, newspapers disappear. Um, and now, you know, when you look at the mix of paper that's coming in, you actually have to look for a newspaper. I mean, what's left is the weeklies and the, you know, the, the daily paper, which is about this thick. So um, very few subscribers left, and obviously that's not going to change. So the mix of paper is so much different than it was 30 years ago when we started these programs because we started them when it was 90% newspaper and now we're left with so little newspaper. And then the other one is contamination and I put contamination in red because it's the only variable that we have any control over. We really don't have control over supply and demand or newspapers, but we do have control over contamination. Over the years, we have been tolerant uh, with contamination because the market was cut tolerant. China was buying most of this material. China didn't care if there was 10% trash in the mix. They didn't care if there was 20%. They sometimes didn't care if there was 30 and 40% trash. They, they pay for all of it. So um, the whole industry kind of fell into this groove that uh, you know, we pick out the gross contamination. You know, we, we pick out the, the big stuff, the bowling balls and the snakes and the deer carcasses and those types of things. But the little stuff, um, the straws and the caps um, and a little bit of food waste, uh, you know, those things you know, we didn't really spend the time to remove. So when China um, got out of the market, um, they got out because, because of the contamination. Um, we used to sell all our paper to Maine Mills. So all our paper went to Maine um, uh, manufacturers of paper, some of those being newsprint mills. When the newsprint markets died, um, you know, 12 or plus years ago, um, there was really no mills that were taking that post-consumer uh, paper. And so China was there to pick up those pieces. And, you know, we kind of were worried for a while where we were going to, when these mills were, began to close, where we were going to take all this paper. Um, China was there, and not only were they there, but they paid a premium. Prices that we had never experienced before, values that we had never experienced before. Why? They were shipping goods to the United States, and so cheap transportation back to China. Uh, and they were filling every one of those containers. So that went on for, you know, a, over a decade uh, without really much of a problem. And then the, the uh, China instituted what they called the National Sword, which was a ban on scrap imports. And this, this quote I really hit home to me um, it, about a year ago. It may, the ban, result in chaos in society, which it has. Some voices that have been critical of Chinese policies are downplaying their own culpability or responsibility to adjust accordingly. And really, as a, uh, as a professional in the recycling and solid waste industry, I couldn't agree more with that. Because we knew, uh, you know, we knew that China was not a sustainable model to be sending contaminated material, highly contaminated material in some cases, um, to China and, and expect to get paid those high prices that they were paying, sometimes well over $100 a ton. So you can see, um, we kind of live and die by um, the scrap specification circular, which provides a contaminant level of 5%. So that's kind of what we've been working with for, I've been in the industry for 30 years. Um, and China's new uh, requirement is 0.5. So they've lowered it from 5% from to 0.5%. Um, which is um, something that really isn't attainable when you're talking about post-consumer material, material that's coming out of um, residential households. So by and large, they're still taking material, but they're taking the clean of the clean. Um, they're taking oftentimes pre-consumer material, material that's never even reached the, the, the homeowner. Grocery store cardboard tends to be very clean because somebody's hand sorting all of that into a baler, um, and, and there's so much of it. Um, so this is what you can kind of see what's happened over the last year, China really being the, 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 the uh, majority of exports going into China in 2017, and now the rest of Asia really has taken over since then. So China is still importing material, but it, uh, it is not the post-consumer material that they once were importing. And this really is, it has affected the entire world, not, not just the United States. <clears throat> Is, is China ever coming back? Um, I think some, we've, we're beginning to see some, light, some, some, some sign of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, what we have seen is the largest Chinese mill that is starving for paper, because remember, it's the government that won't let the paper in. The industry in China wants the paper. Um, and, and so they're trying to figure out how they can get US paper, which is a higher quality paper, into their mills. 
And so they've purchased four mills in the United States. One of the, two of the mills are in Maine, hmm. one in Wisconsin and one in West Virginia. So the Rumford Mill, they purchased the Rumford Mill, um, and their plan, what they've told us, is that they're going to make recycled pulp at that mill. So they will take in recycled scrap paper, make recycled pulp that they get content, then ship to either domestic or Chinese paper mills to make new paper um, as a way of getting the, the fiber that they need to make new, new paper. So if that happens, um, the other mill, by the way, is in Old Town. But if that happens, um, and we're still you know, a couple years out, that'll create a huge demand for the Northeast. And they're talking about a reach you know, going into Montreal, um, into New York City, Boston. I mean, that, I mean, we're even closer than them. So that we will really be on the upper hand uh, of that scenario if it does happen um, according to their plan. So with that said, we're also seeing other domestic um, uh, activity going on, basically because there's this very, there, there's this mixed paper commodity um, that has been going to China for over a decade and now is available. It's going to Asia, but it's going to Asia, uh, other Asia, Asian countries at very low prices. So the, the domestic mills are saying, hey, look, if we, can take, if we can get that scrap paper at those low prices, we want in too. And so we're seeing a lot of activity um, in, in North America uh, on that front. Um, moving to contamination, um, contamination is, is something that we have to address in order to be successful in our recycling programs. And um, our contamination it really spreads across the spectrum. And as I mentioned, we get a little bit of everything. We can clean up the loads to some degree, but when loads come in and they're 30 and 40% contaminated, we can't run the line slow enough to remove all that contamination and be ready for tomorrow's deliveries. And that's really what drives us is production. We have to be ready for tomorrow's delivery. So we can only run the line as slow, and, and there's a cost to running the line slow, um, but we can only run the line as slow as to keep up with, with incoming material. Um, we're also seeing this massive transition in packaging. Um, it, you recall, you know, a laundry detergent used to be in a, in a box, in a powder form, and then it went to the jug, and, and that's how we we really designed our facility was to process these jugs of plastic and now it's switching over to flexible packaging the pouches and the bags and all that flexible packaging is not recyclable um, in, in, in a commercial market um, only on a, an experimental basis and, and very far and few between so that material has to go to the waste to energy facility but it's showing up in the recycling cart and that's the problem that we have is people think it's a package and they're putting it in the recycling cart instead of where it belongs and that's the waste energy cart and it's happening i mean we're seeing pizza switching over from boxes to flexible packaging and now home delivery you know 20 years ago we didn't have any cardboard from the residential sector and then we ramped up cardboard because it ended up at the doorstep and now we're transitioning away from cardboard now to i'm sure if you've purchased an article of clothing and it, it, it was home delivered, it probably came in a bag. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, flexible packaging that has to go into okay. the, tr the trash cart as opposed to the recycling cart. So that's a big problem for us. And so we've, we've been at this campaign for a year now trying to convince the public where, which bin it should go in. Um, and to not wish cycle where you want to recycle everything possible. And the Recyclopedia has been a tool for those wish cyclers um, to find out whether it's recyclable or not in the program. And, and that's worked out quite well. 30 years ago, we had a hotline. I had it staffed with 10 people with people calling every day. Of course, nobody likes to make a phone call today. So they like to find this information out, and it's available to them um, on, the web, on the website. Um, we're going to continue our, our efforts educating our, our communities, um, um, particularly with the school groups. As I mentioned, this is here at our facility. I love this picture because it aligns this, the school bus with, with the garbage truck and something that, that education we feel is, is very important. Um, we're going to continue with our earned media stories, um, uh, paid media to reinforce. Again, I mentioned the tabling at events, town council presentations like this. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, open house where we bring, um, we bring uh, folks to our facility um, who will go home and then talk to 10 or 20 or 30 other people, um, social media, and then we really need those ch champions, those, those leadership champions to make a difference on, on recycling education. 
We are looking at facility improvements. The industry is, is, is reacting to the contamination because, again, it's not just us. It's the entire industry. And so ro robotics is, is entering the industry in the lower right-hand corner there. Um, you're, you're seeing a more and more sw a switch from, from manual um, contamination removal to robotics. Um, so my summary remarks, um, recycling has served us well. Um, you know, for, for you folks, over, you know, just over the last 10 years at 2,400 tons per year, um, that's about $170,000 of savings that you didn't have to pay in tipping fees times 10, you know, you're looking at, you know, closing in on $2 million worth of savings. So recycling and tipping fees. So recycling, I think, has really served us well on the financial front, but also has allowed us to maintain space in our landfill. Otherwise, we too would have been shipping our waste to faraway places. Um, we believe that in the long run, we'll set, recycling will win out and we'll be able to get through this challenging period. Um, again, I mentioned the newspaper. It's not in the mix that's presented the industry with, with a, you know, quite a challenge, um, but I think we'll get through that as well. Flexible packaging, um, we are addressing legislatively and, 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 and also, uh, you know, the recyclability of it. We want to make sure that packages um, are being made so that they can be recycled um, whenever possible. Um, we have to do something about contamination, which is, I think, one of the primary reasons why we're here tonight. And, um, you know, if you look, really nobody knows exactly, it's kind of like the stock market, nobody really knows exactly where the markets are going. We only have history to tell us, and historically, markets have cycled. And um, in, in my experience, um, you know, the market has cycled several times. This one has been more challenging because of the added variables um, of contamination and the newspapers basically disappearing over the last five to ten years. Um, this year we are implementing, so what we did um, from EcoMaine, and again we're community owned and Scarborough is an owner community, we basically took the cost of running our recycling facility um, and the loss this year was $35 a ton. So that's the cost that, ha that has to be, somehow we have to cover that cost. And so we either have to charge it on the tipping fee for solid waste or we have to charge it for the tipping fee on recyclable materials. The board um, discussed this at great length and we came to the conclusion that recycling has to begin to support itself. So the charge is being put placed on recycling um, and that will make the recycling facility whole for processing material. It used to operate at a surplus, um, but that's not the case now. Um, that does not include contamination. So if there's <coughs> contamination coming in, so let's say 50% of your load is trash. The trash has to be dealt with. It has to be sorted, it has to be separated, and then once it's separated, it has to be brought to the waste energy facility, which has a tipping fee of $70.50 $70 a ton. Um, that tipping fee is going to $73 July 1st. So th that, that, that can't be, somebody has to bear that cost, and, and, and the, the member communities um, obviously are, are the ones who are being shouldered with that expense because it's a real expense. They own the organization and um, it's a real expense that has to be covered. So we do have some increases in, in expenditures. Um, all I can say is that we've had a long um, haul of favorable recycling markets um, that we weren't able to, ha we, we were able to keep costs uh, static for quite some time. We haven't had a tipping fee increase in, in six years. In fact, six years ago, we lowered it 20% from $88 a ton to $70 a ton. So, um, that's kind of, I guess, where setting the stage of where we're at today, and um, I appreciate your attention. Turn it over to thank you, the Kevin. Local folks. Just need to switch. Well, Jamie's switching that over. Yeah. The thirty-five dollar a ton. Can you speak a little bit about your about the fact that we're some of the other sources and how we've been able to keep it that low? I mean, that's that 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 number. You've you've had some other. Uh, sources of, in, of uh, recyclables that are coming in that are cleaner, that are going at a higher rate, so that allows you to right. help with that cost. The going rate in New England for um, tipping fees for recyclables is about $130 to $150 a ton. Mm -hmm. And that's what the private uh, corporations who, uh, you know, private corporations have to earn a profit off this. And so, um, 
you know, 15, 18 months ago, the, the, the month that they, you know, that they had, you know, a shortage in, in, in profitability in the recycling programs, those rates started to increase. Um, because if you're a for-profit corporation, you, you have to be able to, to cover your expenses and then some. Um, we actually, uh, as the eco-main communities, put uh, money into a rainy day fund, into our reserves. Um, we actually um, had a reserve that was specifically, it was, we had a half a million dollars in there to cover poor recycling markets. Um, and so we put that because we knew that this market <coughs> was going to eventually cycle out. And so we put that in there and uh, the board over the years have, has, has adjusted those, those reserves. Um, but the bottom line was that those reserves were there and have covered the owner communities for the last um, for the last 18 months of bad recycling markets. So I think our owner communities have really um, been way ahead of um, of in terms of financial uh, security with the recycling markets because those reserves have been there. That wasn't meant to be a long-term solution. It was meant to cover a, a very poor market. This market has continued now um, for 18 months and, and has presented a problem. And we don't know when it's going to cycle. We don't know when it's going to come back. I think we will, we will enjoy the returns when it does come back. Um, but for right now, we've had to institute this charge, this $35, which I still think is quite a bit less than where you would be or anyone would be if they were reliant on the private market to take their recyclable materials. Um, and that's mostly because of, of the, the reserves and the other recycling activities that take place at our recycling facilities. So for example, we take in commercial cardboard that is still a positive market. And so that helps to offset the owner community's expense when it comes to recycling um, their own materials. So we, we, we really try to bring as much commercial material in, pre-consumer material, it's cleaner material, and it has a better revenue. So we'll switch gears um, to talk specifically about Scarborough now um, and give you some information about what our recycling outlook looks like. Um, so in 2018, our um, townwide recycling rate was um, right around 30%, and that's, I think, average for, um, for the state. Um, currently, based on reports that we're getting on a monthly basis from EcoMaine, our contamination rate is about 23%. So every load of recycling has approximately 23% of it is made up of trash that can't be recycled. Um, Jamie, and, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, What's a, how big is a load when you talk about a load? Ton. So it's, it's based on tonnage and it depends on, it's basically a full truck, but okay. it can vary based on what it's made up of. Um, food waste, for example, is very heavy. So if our, um, if our load, recycling load is contaminated with food waste, it's a lot heavier than if it's um, paper and plastic. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, uh, recycling loads that are too contaminated are rejected, meaning um, you know, if it's above 25, 26% contamination, it, it's not worth it to EcoMain to even try to sort out um, the, what can be recycled. And so it gets rejected and is moved from the recycling facility to the waste to energy um, facility and processed as solid waste. Um, in January, uh, we began, EcoMain started charging um, its member communities for these rejected loads. Um, and so there's some information up there. In January, we had 79 loads of recycling rejected. Um, and it cost us $10,000. Um, we got a little bit better in February and March, um, 38 and 36 loads rejected. Um, and uh, I will note that our silver bullets were pulled out of Walmart in January, so we don't know for sure that that was related. Um, mm. Why we saw a little bit of a, a decrease. I was thinking like holidays, right after the holidays. Holidays. Well, that's what I was yeah, thinking. that's a, a good one too. But in that one, I mean, holidays. People tr eat. Make trash and recycling eat goes and up a lot in yeah. between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. Can sure. you tell from? I know there's scanners on the can. Can you tell where the contaminated loads are coming from? With the technology? <laughs> That's a really good question, and I have in my notes. Um, it's a townwide issue, so um, we obviously have um, you know five trash and recycling routes a week. Not one route is any better or worse than <laughs> any others. It's pretty prolific, right between 20 to 25 percent um, on every day of the week. 
Hmm. So that's some of the analysis that I've been doing when we get the information from EcoMain. Could you give us like a, how is something rejected? Is somebody eyeball it or does it get dumped onto the belt? And how does that work? How does the rejection process work? So Kevin, you might be able to speak to this a little bit better, but actually Mike and I um, and Steve Buckley went and visited yeah. EcoMain on Friday so we could see this process. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a truck is brought in and um, they kind of do a, a quick count of what is visible in the pile. Um, and they pick a couple loads each day to look more closely at to work on calibrating and make sure that um, their estimates are, are accurate. And I think they said between, right around, they're plus or minus 5% yeah. typically. Yeah. They actually dump the entire load on the floor. Yes. So it's, it's kind of there to, to yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit to uh, if there's any cross-contamination? Because there's some haulers that will haul in one community, maybe haul some from another or hold it and bring it together. How is that managed so that they can understand that? So Pine Tree is supposed to only haul yeah. Scarborough's um, trash it, in, per truck. And, and in reality, I mean, in, in the past, it's been an issue. Yeah. Well, I mean, years ago. Yeah. Because we're, because we're, we're an automated, automated system yeah. at the curbside, there's, there's only us in South Portland. And on a typical day, there's two, two and a half trucks in Scarborough alone hauling. So mm -hmm. the, the chances of them having a partial yeah. load is, is pretty slim. So we're, we're confident with that. What, what, what about, uh, uh, only because it's outside of just Scarborough, but the communities that are farther north, sometimes they hold the trash in a transfer station mm -hmm. and they get other communities that will come in. Is that still, do you still see that being a little bit? I, that is problem secure? isn't as, uh, I don't think it's as uh, a big a problem as it used to be okay. years ago. Yeah. So um, the cross con contamination between communities um, is, I think the, the haulers recognize that they don't want to get into that mess yep. and have re attempted to stay away from that. So kudos to them for doing that. Great. Thanks. So in just getting a look at, at the tipping fees. So Kevin, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I did check in with Mike on this, but we are currently not paying 70 or $35 per ton for correct. recycling. Okay. So that goes into effect July 1. So currently, as of January 1st, our tipping fees, we're not paying anything for clean recycling. That's still being processed um, without a fee. Uh, municipal solid waste is $70.50 a ton to process. Um, but if our loads are, our recycling loads are um, contaminated and rejected, then we get charged um, $70.50 per ton for that to be moved to the waste to energy plant. Starting July 1, um, we will have the $35 recycling processing fee um, and the Waste to energy, uh, municipal solid waste fee goes up to $73 per ton. Um, and if our recycling is contaminated and rejected, we pay the recycling tipping fee plus the um, municipal solid waste fee. So we will be looking at $108 per ton to deal with our contaminated recycling. What, so when you say clean load, right? Like, it's not zero tolerance for, what's the threshold again? 26%. It's, 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 uh, technically, it's 26%, but it doesn't register until 30%. So a load isn't, for owner communities, a load isn't considered contaminated until it's 30%. And you may have some loads at 10%, at, at you may have some loads at 40%. Um, and I think you had a slide on what the average was. But um, bottom line is owner communities aren't being charged, so there's a little bit of give for the owner communities. Non-owner communities are being charged at 6%. So they start being charged at 6%, and then it's a graduated fee from there. So on average, ours was 23%. So on average, we're, not, we're doing okay. It's just that we've got to do better. Is yeah, that, where and that, there are we that right? Yeah, and there are. I mean, I don't know the exact number of loads that are above thirty percent, but there are several. Mm -hmm. There are well, yeah, a lot yeah, per month. Yeah. So, just um, to clear that up, is the average load twenty three percent contaminated, or twenty three percent of our loads contaminated? Twenty three percent of the tons that we delivered okay. to okay. are, are contaminated. Okay. And, and so, Tom, in the budget, you built. These are the numbers that are built into the budget that's driving the 90,000 or so increase? Yes. Yep. It's, so it's a combination got, of the $35 recycling yeah. fee and we're putting an estimate toward the contamination fees that we're right. paying. That's a bit more elusive for us. Right? So, so the worst case scenario or 
that's in the budget. So if, if, if we can do the education, we can do some of these things, there could be a little bit of a lift. If, yeah, and if, we've got some ideas about how to great. better understand what's going on out there and maybe change some behaviors. Yep. Yep. So Kevin mentioned that um, contamination is an issue everywhere. It's not just in Scarborough, not just in Maine. Um, and this has kind of been coming down the pike. Um, so this is a, an article that was in the Christian Science Monitor recently about um, Sanford, Maine, who in um, the fall of 2018 saw this coming. Um, and they s decided to take steps to inspect and reject recycling loads based on the level of contamination that um, is seen at the curb. Um, so uh, they um, will tag bins if there's too much um, contamination. I mean, you can see there's a mini blind in that picture. <laughs> mini blinds are not recyclable. Um, and so that, that bin won't be picked up that week. Um, and so Sanford, since they started the program, their contamination rate was between 15 and 20 percent. They were able to drop theirs to under 3 percent. Jamie, how much uh, education did they do before they started stickering? Because that's my concern. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of lessons learned, I think, from the Sanford example. And they did not let their, um, from what I understand, they didn't let their residents know that this mm. was going to be starting. Um, and so that is not the approach that we would like to take, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so I have been talking with my counterparts in Wyndham, Falmouth, um, in South Portland, and we brought this idea to Eco Maine to develop an internship program um, where we will hire um, summer staff to go out and do some of the inspections for us. Um, it's, Mike mentioned that South Portland and Scarborough have automated pickups, so if our staff our regular staff were to do it, it's very time intensive. The, um, the other towns, their haulers are gonna be able to help with it because they are getting off the truck to look at the bin and dump it into, into the trucks. Um, but they are still planning to hire summer staff as well. Um, so we would like to hire staff to, to do some of the, the um, recycling cart checks for us. Eco Maine is committed to providing training to the, um, the staff that are hired about what can and can't be recycled and work um, throughout the summer with them to make sure that they're looking at this, seeing the same things and, and um, kind of calibrating their eyes. Uh, University of Southern Maine is going to provide training to them about effective outreach and communication um, because these staff would be on our front lines essentially working with our residents and um, giving them information. Um, and so they'll be inspecting carts at the curb and providing feedback to, re uh, to residents about their recycling. And the feedback would come in the form of these oops tags. Um, and so we're always going to assume that people are trying to do the right thing. And that is what we have heard from, um, and what I've, I've heard from a lot of the other communities that have done this is that people swear that they're, try that they're doing the right thing. And um, recycling markets, do tend to change and sometimes things are, are accepted um, and the markets change and they can't be taken anymore. Um, clothing has never been taken, so that is you know an issue. But um, the feedback, uh, the tags will come in three different colors. A green tag is not really an oops tag. That's like their gold star, good job, keep up the great work. Um, a yellow tag is an indication that there are some non-recyclables in there. We understand, you know, why they might think that they're recycled and there aren't enough in there um, for it to, for the bin to be rejected, but it will have information about what the items are and that they shouldn't be placed in the bin again, but um, their materials would still be taken. Red tags um, would mean that there's just too many recyclables and the bin wouldn't be picked up. Will we be educating people prior to this because I'll tell you right now I'm a perfect example of someone who had no clue like I was putting paper towels into recycling yeah and then I found out you know I'm talking to Larissa that oh you can't put paper towels in recycling I'm like well <laughs> yeah, when you look at the sticker <laughs> well when you look at the sticker that's on it says paper it says mm -hmm. you know whatever so we're probably doing a good job, I know we're doing a good job of uh, educating kids mm -hmm. and families with kids. Well, yep. I'm not a family with a kid. I'm an older person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not right. as savvy as I should be. And my concern is, because I have heard from s some constituents who've been talking to each yep. other, that they're very concerned, number one, about someone snooping through their trash. That's right. one thing I've heard. And the other thing is, well, no one's really taught 
us about recycling. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how we were going to address that. Okay. Um, so let's get into that. So um, we've started doing a weekly um, Facebook post called Which Bin Wednesday, where we post information, um, what bin should certain items go in, and that based on the, the comments and feedback that we've heard from people, that is at least inspiring them to go look for more information and get them thinking about what they're putting in their recycling bins. So that's great. Um, we're going to get the, we, the plan is to get the word out on this program, article in the leader, information on our Facebook page and on the website, and then direct outreach to residents on the selected route. So we'll be um, email, or mailing th um, actual mail uh, that they can then recycle afterwards if they want to, um, a letter about the, the program and um, what it entails, and then there will be a postcard reminder. The bottom picture there is um, an example of a postcard um, that has the, the yes and no, what can and should not go into uh, recycling carts um, for, for information, and all of that will direct to a website with the um, EcoMains do and don't list and things like that. Um, and the Recyclopedia, that's a great reference, and I have it on my phone and use it all the time, even though I'm teaching people about this stuff. Feels the, today was the first time I've ever heard of that. Okay. Yeah. So. You know, it, it, for me, I mean, just, just the two things I noticed, I, I recycle, but I put it in a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you could yeah, submit the plastic yeah. bag, so that, I thought I was doing the right thing. Right. Apparently, you're not supposed to use those plastic bags to... You are not, even though you can go to the store and buy recycled plastic bags that are meant to go in your yeah. recycling bins. Like, that's a huge issue, too, yeah. um, that you stores carry those. Um, and then we're planning to put uh, signs out along the route so that people um, on the, who live on the route will know, will hopefully see the sign in their neighborhood as well. Um, and so if they've ignored the letter, ignored the postcard, haven't read the paper, haven't looked on our website, and haven't visited Facebook, hopefully they'll notice that as they're driving down the road. Are you going to have those interns, I'm calling them interns, whatever they are, knocking on doors, doing actual door knocking with education? No. educational materials? They will have materials with them, but um, the thing is, if they're, they need to try to stay ahead of the truck. And Kevin mentioned the trucks are at the curb for 14 seconds, seconds per household. No, and I get that, but I was just wondering as a prequel, in other words, take a week or two prior to them going with the trucks mm -hmm. to do door-to-door -door, uh, attempt at educating. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I think that's helpful, but okay. that's me. Yeah, we can but think of with the elders. Well, we can. Um, we'll definitely take that into consideration and see if we can work that work that in. Um, and Jean Marie, you mentioned um, privacy being a concern. So, um, just to note that our our recycling ordinance says that we um, the town can inspect re recycling carts. Um, these inspections are going to have to go really quickly. The um, the staff are not, not going to touch the items in the bin. They're going to lift the li the lid look in, see what they can see. They won't move things or rummage anything around. Um, and they won't be taking note of any personally identifiable information. You know, that you need to get that out to the public right. for sure. Definitely, and that would go in the, in the notification letter as well. So the scope of this is one day a week? What one day, day a week. What day a week have you? So um, that we initially were thinking Tuesday. So um, Tuesday is the orange section of the map. Um, we are not going to get to the full route on Tuesday. Um, my mm -hmm. hope is I'm to do me. one of the two and a half trucks that run on Tuesday and get as much of that truck done. Um, and my thought was Tuesday because it's our shortest route. And so I'm hoping that um, our, our staff would be able to get to as many houses as possible on that route. Um, but this hasn't been finalized yet, so happy to hear feedback from others about um, which the, the, the other thought, Bill, <clears throat> is that if, if we start in a section of that, of that Tuesday run and we spend a couple, two week, a, a couple of weeks in there and we're seeing a, a vast improvement and mm -hmm. then we start seeing some consistency there, we can go to other portions of that, of that, uh, of that same Tuesday weekly run, R work with another truck, so to speak, right. uh, to try and spread out our, our resources as much as we possibly can. Because the benefit that you might gain from the uh, bins you hit and the people you educate, how that doesn't translate over right. to right. the rest of the community. Yeah, and this is really um, our, our first try at this level of outreach. Um, and so 
I think that we're going to have a lot of lessons learned from this, and hopefully we have some results too. It's been really successful in other areas. Stanford is an example. Um, and I know other towns have tried to do just the tags for information, not actually re um, you know, rejecting the bins or anything like that, and it hasn't worked. Pure mm -hmm. education doesn't work. People need, right. it needs to, for better or for worse, it needs to affect them, and they need to know that they are. Um, Sanford got to 3%, That's which is remarkable. Yeah. Right. Did they do the whole town? Yes, they were able to do their whole town. Well, they're more densely populated than we are. Our population spread and all And they're working over. with their yeah. hauler, too, yeah. because, like, I, the, in the picture, the person was off the truck looking in the bin, so um, they yeah. were able to partner with their hauler to, yeah. to make that happen. And they're just not taking contaminated. So right. it's easy to get the 3% when you don't pick it up. Right. right. And, yeah. and yeah. our... Yeah. People are exactly. <laughs> it's only one choice. Yeah. Yeah. And our thought was for, for the first week, we would take that educational approach. Um, the, any of the bins that get a red tag, we'll ask our hauler to, to still take, put in the trash side of the truck, not in the recycling side of the truck. But after that first week, we would start um, not picking them up. Oh, I was waiting for her to call on Katie. Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Even school. Um, so, I, I, and I think we talked about this at the Conservation Commission, maybe, when we were talking about One thing I would add to your plan might be some quick hit short videos. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, like, the Bill and I got that covered. <laughs> I, wrote, I was already missing I know, they're not going viral. I was going to mention it earlier, but I was waiting. <laughs> Although they called me one of you guys today on the... So, anyway. Um, but I think that people really like those quick. It's easy. If you can, the easier we can Oh, we're doing them. Yeah. I already yeah. have them. We're up. meeting with them tomorrow. So, so we, actually, we actually have that meeting tomorrow morning. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And, and get some kids doing them. Too. Kids, kids like me doing those stuff. So I, I know you're going you're to be targeting the uh, the western part of town, but we are moving into summertime. So uh, I don't want to blame the summer people, but uh, yeah. you know that's a factor uh, that maybe some of these other towns, right, that down Sanford end up. But yeah, that's a, yeah. It's a factor. That's why they're western. Yeah, yeah. True. that is true. true. So and we are working on um, on offering more resources and just educational materials. We've got um, Eco Main stickers um, for the lids of. Um, the recycling carts that have the do don't on there. Um, we also have magnets um, that we're going to be handing out with for a quick reference guide of the the do and don't list as well. Um, and our silver bullets are an issue. We're down to one so set of silver bullets now, and we're hoping that that will help. Um, and my hope is that our the the interns that are hired, we can station at our silver bullets for a couple hours each week and talk yep. to people that are coming, um, check out what That's they're. Disgusting check out what they're putting in the silver bullets. Yeah. Incidentally, has anyone heard any concern from residents that uh, we're now down to one location? Okay. Yeah, they don't like it, but when you sit there and tell them the couches are being deposited <laughs> there and refrigerators yeah. and everything else, they kind of get, they get quiet. Yeah, they we've, we've also removed some of the fence panels down at this yeah. one at Main yeah. Veterans Home, really to discourage that. Oh, so you can't, see, yes, you can't see it. And it's at a you know, busy location right on Route 1, so we plus it's across from Public Safety Building, where <laughs> <laughs> that might be a deterrent. Okay. No, hope, hope, hopefully, if we can, if we can I kind of... I take cameras, might catch them. <laughs> uh, exactly. If, if, if we can kind of condense the program a little bit, get back on an even keel, start with some education, that sort of thing, there's no law saying that we can't expand again at a later date. Right. And so, you know, we need to get we need to get a handle on this now, uh, both for the quality of the product and, and also from cost perspective. So this is this is the attempt at trying to do that. And uh, you know, obviously there are there are folks that uh, that have additional recycling needs, and that's what those silver bullets are for. So, um, yeah. Again, uh, even though I was being kind of coy, um, the challenge with the silver bullet at the veterans home is that it's right on Route One, so we get a huge amount of traffic that's coming from other communities. That probably deposit quite a bit of stuff there. At least over the over the past, they definitely have. Right. We've worn out our welcome, uh, right? And for obvious and good reasons, uh, some of the corporations that have been good supporters of ours yeah. just uh, it's it's just a, a problem detracting yeah. from their business, and so uh, consequently, we're down to one. Yeah, yeah. And it's more crowded. I I never had a problem pulling in to the veterans' home to the, today, dropping garbage off in the 
composting was mobbed. They had, there was four vehicles inside that tiny space. Yeah. And You're the one who started dropping off garbage. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't see that. In the, in, the in the compost. compost. Oh, the compost one. Okay. So, this would be a question for Kevin, and it might be uh, you know, off uh, track here a little bit, but is there any correlation um, uh, of uh, contamination with the type of collection? In other words, are this paper bag do better with less contamination? Yeah, I think that there is, um, we've, we've been reluctant to try to do contamination on a community by community basis because there's so many different variables that come into play. Um, so your, your point is well taken. Yeah, in a pay-as-you-throw community, there's a financial incentive to put it in the recycling container. Um, in a cart-based community, there, it, it's so, the recycling cart is so big that there's space in there for cross-contamination. So I think in, yes, you're right, there's different variables at play, um, but we're, we're having, you know, I'm doing this in every community. And the communities that have drop-off facilities um, have actually, in some cases, um, put a person there who is making sure and policing that container to make sure no, I mean, Bridgeton is an example. They put somebody there, tw you know, 24-7, and, you know, they're down to 1% or less. Wow. Now, you know, the, the downside of that is you, you can't have, in a populated area like Scarborough, you can't have a drop-off center because everybody would be driving in and the environmental footprint would be wasted. So um, yes, it does depend on, on the type of collection that you have. In the city of Portland, they have municipal collection. Okay. So they have their drivers who are doing a certain level of inspecting themselves. If you ask your, um, your vendor to do that, they're going to have to get paid for that because they're not going to be able to do it in 14 seconds. Okay. So um, that's going to cost extra. So I think this, app, this, this path forward is, is an alternative to right. that. Um, and what's interesting is I was in the city of Rochester in, in 1989 doing oops letters because of contamination way back then. Um, so this kind of comes circulates every once in a while and um, we got through that and, and I think that eventually we'll get through this. I might feel overly optimistic, but I really think, you know, it's more of a people don't know what they don't know. Yeah, they don't and know they, they, would, know. they want to do the right thing and they think they're doing the right thing and that, that's the perspective that we're taking. I mean, yeah. I think I think that's what it is. You know, Kevin Kevin hit hit the nail right on the head when he said wish wish cycling. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> people people look at you know they, they they look they look at this and they go, well, it, it might be recyclable, but it might be trash. Yeah, I'll put it in on the outside chance it is recycling. Well, it's not. Right. So like, <laughs> you know, so like, 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 you know, the, you know the, the, what's the foil pudding. We're doing right. That. So uh, those are neither of those are right. <laughs> The people think they container. are but the plastic container that it's in. So the bottom is, but the top is not. But if it all goes in the same one, I you're, know you're offsetting what issue. you just tried to do for right. that. That's but the issue. The, the the other good thing to remember is is that we are. I mean, we're a waste of energy places. So this. I mean, this is it. There's there's a level of beneficial use even when it's going into the trash can. So you don't That's have to right. be you don't have to be completely <laughs> upset about it. I mean, it's it's yeah. creating energy. It's it's creating revenue for. For, for Eco Main and, for, and and by extension for the for the owner communities, us and so forth and so on. So we're hoping to increase that waste of energy income. Correct. That's right. Thanks to your <laughs> help there, I appreciate that. We have a bill to try to move us up to a Class One renewable, which would elevate the value of the energy that we sell. Yeah. Just one up sure, up sure, uh, operational observation. I know you chose the North Scarborough route because it's more manageable. That's not North Scarborough. That's West Scarborough. I live in Green, which is West Scarborough. West Scarborough, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it does occur to me those are rural roads with point. higher speeds, and I just a, a thought, a cautionary thought about interns out there. I want to make sure we're yeah. keeping them safe. Well, there's, there's some the, protecting them. There's some residentials, and I think there's some people that live on that street too. That would, on some of those streets, that would be good candidates for trying things out on calm. <laughs> What? I just don't <clears throat> I, 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 admittedly, I said I want to be in the service <laughs> area. Oh, that's right. right. You're in. You're in. He's in. Right, so wait. He's in. Which, which day of the week do you have trash pickup? 
<laughs> Monday, so I think I'm all oh, oh, okay. well, I mean, like I said, nothing is set in stone That's yet. Right. So. Yeah, like, uh, I would be pleased to be in this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in it? It'll help my conversations with Good. residents. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, if I could ask one, one question for Tom. Sure. So if you can, Tom, if you could remind me, the overall solid waste budget for everything in, include recycling, solid waste management, what is that total value? It's about one point. Five or six million. Six. Now. I was going to say one point six off the top. Of my Which head. used to be some ways around eight hundred thousand dollars, probably ten or fifteen years ago, if I remember right. Well, that cost is kind of evenly split between right. disposal and yeah. collection, and, and hazardous household waste, right, and and all those other programs. I I think that people just need to understand what the total budget is in comparison to the total, you know, to the total cost, or the total budget for solid waste in comparison to the total cost of the town's budget. Yeah, it's significant. Should. We should remember, we rolled out a really a Cadillac solid waste plan with this curbside mm -hmm. recycling right. back in 2006 it's or been 11 years. Um, yeah. 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 I remember. And it's it a, it's a great value to... So the is, the, is the rule of thumb here that when in doubt, don't put it in the recycling? Are Which is counterintuitive because everyone When in wants, doubt, throw it out. Yeah, everyone wants to do the right thing, and if you can recycle more, <laughs> but it's better that's it's good. But, I like, but here, it's gonna the, cost us. the more responsible thing so is, know. when in doubt, trash, put it in the trash. Just, so don't, think, just don't put it on a sticker that we have to put on some trash can because that's an episode. Yeah, no. We'll start with it in our own ordinance with stickers. So I think the real challenge will be, I expect we'll see some success in the service in the study area, is how we roll that out. Townwide, yeah. right. will be where the impact is. Right, we can do it. We did it before. <clears throat> yeah, I think people are going to be receptive yeah. overall. I really do. Point your next yeah. communications. I, 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 I remember when this came out no. in six. I mean, there were a lot of people I mean, upset table, because of the cost of the bin and the whole implementation. Yeah. And then within a year and two, or even two years, we saw the benefit of it. So, you know, there might be some hardship of getting this started, but I think long term, this is actually a very Take significant notice. change. Well, and the reason that we ended up at 30% recycling, you yeah. know, granted we have contamination. Yeah, Prior to that, we were 19% recycling. We went curbside. That was what the, the, the right. convenience is what yeah. is what folks were looking for. So, That's right. so as we creep up on seven, does anybody else have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, that was a great presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Great Thanks. job. Doing a great job. Appreciate Thank you. It. Great ideas. Me too. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for letting yeah. us know. Nobody mentioned it. You're up here. Yes, I do have. Thank you. I do have some handouts. Are those recycled? They are, and they're made of recycled paper too. Yeah. So, and uh, <laughs> and uh, having sat on the Echo Main board, Kevin really is one of the gurus, one of the real Thank uh, you. Uh, most prominent people in this business. Been in the business for decades, uh, and, and has always uh, received high marks for his performance. So we're hearing it from a good source. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
well. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is the Scarborough Town Council, Wednesday, May 1st. Um, so I'd like to call the meeting to order at this point, and we'll start with the Pledge of the Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, roll call. Councilor Baybine. Present. Councilor Johnson. Present. Councilor Foley. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor Donovan. Here. Councilor Hamill. Here. And Chairman Hayes. Here. And with that, we'll move into general public comments, item number four. So anybody that's here to make a, a, a public comment that doesn't have it to do with any of the agenda items that we have, this would be the time to come forth. Sure. You want to come up and join us at the podium and give us your name and address and let us know what you want to share with us. Good evening. My name is Bruce Flaherty. I'm from Augusta. That's my legal residence. However, I spend a lot of time at the family cottage Six Pinewood Circle here in Scarborough. Now, I'm very much involved with the Spirit of America Volunteer Recognition Program. Now, Mainers do great things to help others, including the youth who raised $275 from hot cho chocolate <coughs> sales to buy needy children Christmas toys, and the police officer who saved the lives of two youths as their home was engulfed in flames. However, it's sad that oftentimes people like this who do such beautiful things to help others don't get the recognition they deserve from their local officials or from anyone else. Now, Spirit of America Foundation is a 501c3 public charity based in Augusta, and it's dedicated to encouraging and promoting volunteerism. And it allows the Spirit of America Foundation tribute to be presented in the name of any mun main municipality to honor a person, project, or group for outstanding community service. Now, last year, over 160 main municipalities picked a Spirit of America winner. Now, municipalities typically honor the recipients at the annual town meeting or during the month of April, but they may do so at any other time of the year. Now, Maine Municipal Association and its current president, Mary Sabins, are very supportive of this program. If you go to the Maine Municipal Association website under recent announcements and you'll scroll down a ways, you'll find a link to the Spirit of America program. And if you still can retrieve the uh, uh, MMA this month uh, email newsletter from January, you'll find mention of the program there. Mary's hometown of Vassalboro is one of many that's been involved in this program for many, many years. Important points. There is no fee whatsoever to participate in this program. And there's lots of information on a website. S-P-I-R-O-A-F-T dot com slash gems. And you can find a reference to that on the handout that you would have received. Now, the Spirit of America winner that Scarborough <coughs> would select this year will be honored at a Cumberland County ceremony. Now, last year, Scarborough Police Department, which as you know is a pace setter statewide in the war against drugs, they were the ones from Scarborough who were honored at the Cumberland County ceremony on November the 13th. 
And now it should have been actually Scarborough Town Council instead of Spirit of America Foundation's main chapter to pick the recipient of the award. Somebody from Scarborough was honored. The police chief was there, Robbie Moulton, and he really enjoyed the ceremony and the recognition. Now, we're into a brand new year. The deadline is June 30th. So your town of Scarborough has plenty of time to pick the local person, project, or group to receive the 2019 Scarborough Spirit of America Award for Outstanding Community Service using your own criteria. And if it would be easier on you, you're welcome to designate uh, the person, your person of the year, to be the one to attend this uh, Cumberland County ceremony. You don't have to choose that, but to make it easy for you if you'd like. Okay, Sean, who is, as you know, the legislator, is very familiar with this program. This has been uh, publicized and recognized uh, by the legislature. I went earlier this year to a session and got the uh, uh, House and uh, Senate uh, agendas for the day and so forth. And I was flabbergasted to open it up and see so many in that edition being recognized by the uh, main House of Representatives that day. So, I've done plenty of talking. <laughs> Let me keep quiet for a second and give you a chance to uh, ask questions. The, this program, as I say, is extremely popular in other parts of the state. It started in Augusta. It's been spreading it out. Basically, the closer you have to Augusta, the more towns pick recipients. Thank you. Does, does anyone have any questions or comments? Mm -mm. Thank you for sharing, and we will take that under advisement and, and look at that. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you much. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else would like to join us for your, okay. Mm -hmm. Good evening, counselors. Thank you for um, the time to speak to you a little bit today. Mm -hmm. I'm Steffi Cox. I'm the director of Project Grace, and I'm here to uh, share a little update on the very successful fuel rally that we held in February. What with it still being a little cold and clammy <laughs> out there, it feels <laughs> like uh, um, a good time to tell you about all the, the, the good that came about as a result of that partnership with with all of the town. Um, I'd like to particularly thank the chiefs, um, uh, Mike Thurlow and uh, Robbie Moulton and all of their staff for uh, opening up the public safety building, all the counselors who came to the event and the many groups and organizations, including the, the public library that helped us host this uh, really fun <coughs> event in the middle of winter. Um, we raised over $17,780 together, we, all of us, and it was um, just enough to send about 7,000 gallons out to our neighbors who struggled to keep their homes warm during the coldest part of the winter. Um, groups uh, like uh, West Scarborough United Methodist Church, Blue Point Church, the uh, state manufactured Hillcrest Neighborhood, the Higgins Beach Association, Highland Avenue Greenhouse, um, they held fundraisers to, to help uh, contribute to the fuel fund. Uh, local businesses and banks like KCV Trailer Rentals, uh, Eddie Wooden, Katahdin Trust, Saco Biddeford Savings, Biddeford Savings, they also uh, showed up that day with pretty big checks to help give our fundraising a boost. The Lions, the Kiwanis, the Rotary, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, they were all there. Um, we had the main pops there playing uh, a clarinet quartet, I think mm -hmm. it was. Um, and, the, uh, and then the participation of businesses large and small, Mitchell's Electric and <coughs> Shooting Stars and others. It really was a neighborhood event. And um, in appreciation for that, I want to read you very briefly um, a thank you note we received shortly after the rally. It came with a, a, a very modest check, but a very um, nice message for all of us. To all who care, I want to express your um, 
your time and work uh, devoted to those who need our help. I've had to be one of the ever grateful and appreciative recipients of your mm -hmm. caring. I was able to help families for a few years myself. To give is truly better than to receive, but I'm grateful that you help keep me warm. <coughs> and that, that is just one of the many thank you notes we get from our neighbors who appreciate not only the, act, the, the, the warmth and the heat, but that everybody does care about one another here. We have other projects in partnership with the town, community services and uh, school nutrition department um, are a couple of those who work uh, a lot with us, the school nurses and social workers. We'll talk to you more about those initiatives at another time. I do briefly want to say that uh, the folks building the new public safety building, Landry French, we're out today helping us carry 30 pound boxes of food up and down the steps into the pantry mm -hmm. and, and the police explorers and VIPs were delivering some of them to seniors who couldn't pick them up themselves. So uh, on behalf of Project Grace, I wanna thank you all for your continued uh, support and um, help to, to Project Grace. Have a good evening. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, <clears throat> Councilor Beba. Ms. Cox, I think we need to say thank you to you. So thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> with that, anybody else with public comment this evening? See none, I'll close out public comment. And we'll move to item number five on the agenda, which is the approval of the minutes for both April 3rd regular town council meeting and the April 10th special town council meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Um, is there any discussion, comments, changes, edits that anybody would like to offer? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes? It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, item number six is adjustments to the agenda. I'm not aware that we have any this evening. Item seven are to be signed the treasurer's warrants. I have done that. And so we will move to order number 19024. Um, it's a public hearing on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning Ordinance Section 2, Contract Zoning. Um, and this was, was put forth by the Ordinance Committee. So I don't know, Tom or... or, or uh, I know Jay, Jay Chase is here. Jared, yeah. could provide an introduction. Sure. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you. Uh, as you have noted, Mr. Chairman, this is an item that's coming for you uh, by way of the Ordinance Committee. Um, you know, they asked staff to, to work with them to look at ways to modify the process for contract zoning in the community. And the uh, interest that was expressed by the committee is to update the amendment process for contract zones to really align with the, the process that's in existence for a new contract zone. Um, essentially, the difference, and I'll, you know, I know we spoke about this a few weeks ago as here, but for the uh, benefit of the public, the, the current difference in the ordinance is uh, when a new contract zone is proposed, the first step in the process is a joint meeting between the town council and our planning board. And also, prior to that, that joint hearing, there's public notification that's directly mailed to abutters of the project. Um, and that seems to be pretty successful. The interest is uh, in our current ordinance um, for amendments, the first step in the process is a first reading by this council. Um, and then subsequent to that first reading, the application moves to our planning board. And it's at that stage that uh, abutters are directly uh, given mail notifications. Of course, agendas are always posted, but we know, you know, maybe looking on the website isn't everyone's favorite thing to do every other week. Um, so, as I said, the interest uh, that's been expressed is to, to align those two processes and the language you have before you really uh, um, marries those two together so that whether a contract zone is coming before the town for the very first time or it's coming through for an amendment, um, the, the process would be the same and that process would kick off with that joint hearing between this council and the planning board and would include that opportunity or uh, requirements for public notifications through mail to abutters and allow for public comment right at the outset. Um, so that's the intent of the language you have before you. Thank you. Anybody else like to offer anything from, no? no? So with that, we'll open it to public comment. Anybody want to come up and comment on this particular order? Seeing none, I will close public comment. Thank you.
If I could just make one sure. more uh, yeah. uh, comment that I should have said, that the planning board did hold their um, public hearing on this, uh, I believe it was just Monday night, it feels like a long time ago, but <laughs> two nights ago, and uh, so hopefully you have those minutes before you and there was a favorable recommendation um, coming out of that discussion. Thank you. So we'll move on to item order number 19029, 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed to fiscal year 2020 municipal, municipal school budget. And Tom, I don't know if you want to introduce this or is it just open it up to public comment? Yeah, I really have no prepared yeah. remarks. Uh, this, this is an opportunity for the council to hear from the public regarding the proposal that's still very much in process, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, it's important to receive input uh, at this point. So at this point, would anybody like to come to the podium and comment on the, on the school budget? Good evening, Kelly Murphy, 5 Woodfield Drive. Um, I've emailed you so you know how I feel about the amendment. I find the timing to be strange and um, all the work of the department heads and the, um, with your colleagues on the school board, I find the timing was just strange and kind of disrespectful, so I won't get into that. But what I do want to talk about is this week, the, um, I've come up many years in a row talking about where Scarborough ranks in um, the state of Maine for um, the U.S. News and World Report listing. So this year, Scarborough was eighth, which is great in the top 10 for Maine, but if you look at where Cape Elizabeth was, we're not even within 1,000 spots of Cape Elizabeth. And the reason we can point to every year is the lack of investment in our schools. Um, the unmet needs that are currently part of this year's budget that were listed as unmet, it's kind of a sad list that we can't even fund those. Um, in 1993, there were 93 seniors at Scarborough High School. We are about to graduate 267. In 1993, we had one member, one staff member responsible for post high school placement. In 2019, we have one staff member responsible for placement post high school. So we are preparing our kids for a life after college, after high school for career and college readiness and not even giving them a fighting chance to get into college or into a, a um, work, workforce training or a job after high school. Um, it's great for private businesses that can spawn off it, but we can't just decide that we're not going to fund public education and, um, and have private businesses pick up the slack. I hear over and over again that there should be private public partnerships for the schools. And to you, I say no. That's not the rules for public education. We don't suggest that Scarborough Rescue is a Martin's Point Rescue. We don't say to the people who want repeated beach cleaning that the people who live there, I never go to Higgins Beach because I live closer to Pine Point. So should my tax dollars not go to Higgins Beach? No. It's a public asset for everyone in the community to support. So I just ask you to really, when you're thinking about reductions to be made to the overall budget, municipal or school, Think about what it means to have public entities. And our taxes are supporting those, and it's for everyone. Whether you have kids in the school or not, it's still the responsibility of the town to support it. And let's not have another few years go by. And actually, to point out, there is not even anything in the, <laughs> in the school budget to have another placement staff member added. So that's not even on anyone's wish list. It's so far down down the list of priorities. So I please ask you to just be very thoughtful when making reductions and I ask you to fully fund the school and municipal budgets. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening. My name is Mary Starr. I live at Six Haystack Circle. Um, I'm here to speak about the $1.3 million cut to the budget. Um, well, I have tried to learn more about the current situation and how it affect our town and our schools. It has not been clear to me how this will change our budget process. However, I am concerned and I am against this cut. Um, I do remember when a failed budget vote in 2010, uh, a previous council cut one million from the school budget and we lost close to 40 teachers and we lost the Wentworth and Middle School language program. It was devastating. Those students who missed out on foreign languages in the middle school, including my son, lost major learning opportunities. Um, so please, 
please don't tell me that these cuts don't affect our students in a negative way. It is possible this cut will not affect our schools in such a dramatic way, um, depending on the decisions that are made going forward. But I ask that the council thinks deeply about the budget and the process going forward. I ask you to respect the work of our outstanding superintendent and town manager. Please think about the many hours of work our town staff leaders, our town um, leaders and school leaders spend to create a fiscally responsible budget that will best serve our town, our students, and the entire community. I have a deep respect for the expertise of both of our school and town leaders. And I hope we can work with a budget that invests both in our town and in our school. Thank you for the work you do for our town. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, John Cloutier, 9 Wildwood Lane. And I'm going to read because uh, actually uh, coming up with comments for uh, this budget have been a little bit tricky given the amendment that was made and some of the changes um, put through recently. So I tried to pick my words carefully. Um, I'm here to encourage you to support a reasonable and balanced budget and to talk a little about affordability. The spending proposed in this budget is reasonable and likely won't move the tax rate much next year. It was assembled through a collaborative process with much direction, without much direction from the council or school board with regards to goals or priorities, other than the directive to target a 3% tax rate increase. This budget will likely hit or come close to hitting that target. But is that really the goal of our nine month budget process? To simply increase the tax rate by a fixed percentage each year? I think that we can and should do better. We don't spend enough time talking about where we wanna go as a community, what services we like um, or would like to see, and those that are no longer needed or relevant. Instead, we wind up fighting about an arbitrary tax impact assessment or measurement that is both inaccurate and places too much emphasis on a single source of revenue at the expense of all the others. I understand that there are many in our community who simply cannot afford to pay their tax bill, let alone a bigger tax bill. This problem is not unique to Scarborough, but we do have some unique characteristics that make it a bigger issue for us. Namely, we don't get much funding from the state. Our spending is comparable to our peer group, but we fund so much of that spending through local taxes that the burden feels much worse. The affordability of our taxes is heading in the right direction, but there is quite a way to go before we have a level playing field with, between us and other similar communities. The cost to provide local services per household ranges between nine and nine and a half percent of median income for Scarborough, our peers, and the state of Maine. It's very consistent, which leads me to believe that there's little room for imp improvement on the spending side. What differentiates the tax burden across our peer group, however, is how the state funds are distributed, which is unfair. This budget is reasonable relative to the real growth in our property values as calculated by Maine Revenue Services. Over the past five years, our mill rate increase relative to this valuation has ranged between 0.3 and 1.2%. And the proposed first reading of this budget indicated a 1% increase. The amended first reading came in at a 1% decrease. I encourage you to support a balanced budget that allows for some investment in improving the services available to our community. And I thank you for your um, continued service and the opportunity to participate tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read two. Um, Aaron Rowan, Bonnie Grove Drive. When I listened to the school and municipal budget presentations, I was proud to hear intelligent professionals making strong cases for their departments, using hard data, knowledge of our community, and impressive fiscal restraint. I wondered how their needs assessments would change if they felt unconstrained by predetermined caps, and I worried which of the unasked for line items may come back to haunt us in the future. I saw both weariness and wariness in their faces as they prepared to de defend their departments against the scrutiny they knew would follow. As is true in other towns across the state, since municipalities have been forced to shoulder a bigger share of costs, we've struggled to find a way to balance the needs of students and residents who are ri at risk of being taxed out of their homes. While some have worked to increase Scarborough's tax relief program for seniors, Others have used mock concern and questionable data to grow the ranks of people who vote down the school budget each year. The trick is to pretend that property tax is the only relevant variable. Once you start talking about income inequality, expanding the earned income tax credit, implementing circuit breaker programs, tax rate freezes for groups who would benefit, increased state profit sharing, improvements in our social safety net, or 
progressive shifts in our tax code, you're entering the realm of actual solutions. And the prevailing anti-property tax arguments are only successful because they leverage fear and confusion around who or what is to blame. I read an excellent opinion piece in the New York Times yesterday by economist Paul Krugman in which he talked about zombie issues or a refusal to let an old argument go no matter how completely it's been discredited. It's that phenomenon that allows people to continue on their preferred paths in spite of conclusive evidence that their paths are increasing inequality and oppression, causing harm to the environment, or contributing to things like the school to prison pipeline. It's also that phenomenon that pits vulnerable groups against one another, like students and people on fixed incomes, in battles where the only people who come out on top are the people who are already at the top. Krugman says, in each case, those making denialist arguments, while they may invoke evidence, don't actually care what the evidence says. At a fundamental level, they aren't interested in the truth. Their goal, instead, is to serve a predetermined agenda. In Scarborough, that agenda is keeping property taxes low, and the methods include discrediting town leaders, playing fast and loose with the term fixed income, bemoaning bloated school and municipal budgets, and arguing that our taxes are high while actual evidence points to the opposite being true, given our demographics and array of amenities. So as you decide what kind of bottom line you'll support this year, I simply ask that you set aside your intellectual zombies in favor of hard data. Recognize that a system in which spending priorities become a popularity contest will never lead to equitable spending decisions. Consider the expertise and due diligence demonstrated by both school and municipal leadership and work to find real solutions to regressive taxation that don't rely on shortchanging community safety, public spaces, natural resources, or what is arguably our most precious resource and most pressing responsibility, public education. Thank you. Anybody else like to come up and share with us your thoughts? I guess I'll read, too. Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. The 3% or less goal has been talked about for several years now. I don't understand the big surprise regarding the recent amendment instructing the town manager and superintendent to return with the 3% increase as opposed to the original 4.9 increase. Even a couple town councilors seem surprised when they too have publicly stated that they wanted no more than 3% increase in the mill rate, reval or no reval. Some people have expressed frustration to reduce the increase in the budget by $1.3 million. Most people I've seen and talked to are expressing frustration for other reasons. And not all are on fixed incomes. Plenty are working with families and can't keep up. Not everyone is lucky enough to get an increase, an annual increase or COLA. In the last five years, Social Security recipients have averaged a grand total per year COLA increase of 1.36%. Yes, 1.36% per year. And with the increase in Medicare payments each year, make it zero. So far for next year, it's looking like a 0% increase as it did in 2015. Yes, they're frustrated. Someone close to me had to take another job within their company because of physical limitations. That move cost him $3 an hour, $516 a month, less in pay to be able to keep working. Oh, and his insurance deductibles went up $2,200 a year. Yes, he's frustrated. Recently, I recently read a post on Facebook that broke my heart. It touched on the whole reason I got active with this years ago. Back then, a very well-known Scarborough senior citizen, a recent widower, and I were sitting in his living room chatting, and he wondered aloud to me how he was going to account for the increase in his property taxes with his monthly expenses. He wanted my opinion on which medication he could go without so he could keep his cable TV. Watching TV, he said, was all he had left. Well, anyway, this recent post was regarding a friend's husband who was admitted to the hospital. Come to find out, he ended up hospitalized because he didn't have the money for his medication, so he didn't get it. His family didn't know, so they filled his prescription. The money problems of many are real. They, are, they may be seniors or families or young couples. They go without some things because they can't afford it. I'm happy for those of you 
or us that can afford to buy it, but not everyone is made of money. I applaud those on the town council for having the courage and determination to approach the budget from a different perspective. And I applaud those on the town council that have the courage to look out for the financial interest and limitations of everyone in Scarborough. We need to get this budget passed with the 3% or less goal that the town council has expressed many times and move on. There are already pressing issues that everyone will need to consider very soon, like the, eight, the, like the increasing school population. It is my hope that the town council will continue to think of everyone in town, not only with citizen needs, but with citizen affordability as well. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come forward? Seeing none, I, I guess we'll close public comment. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is Order 19030, 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the new request for a liquor license and food handler license for Stern Seafood, Inc., located at 96 King Street. And this is a, a new establishment uh, located at Pine Point. The applications are um, in line, and I would recommend approval. Approved. These licenses will be issued upon an occupancy permit received by the Planning Codes Office. Thank you. Would anybody like to speak on this item? Good evening. Uh, Vin Clow, one of the owners of Stern Seafood. Um, I don't think you'll notice any change. You know, it's had a liquor license down there over the years. I don't think it'll be any different than it ever was. You know, it's a restaurant. Um, closes at night. <laughs> Not late night. I don't, I don't see any problems I guess so any questions anybody have any questions no thank you yep would anybody else like to come forward and speak on this issue seeing none is there a motion to approve so moved. Is, second um, any discussion comments seeing none all those in favor unanimous thank you um, New business, moving on, order 19031, first reading and refer to the planning board, the proposed amendments to chapter 405 zoning, the zoning ordinance section um, 7H, campus directional signs. Um, looks like, Jay, you're queued up to, to <laughs> bring us up to speed. So. Mm -hmm. yes. Can I just mention something? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so if you didn't realize there is a new electronic system, I'm, I'm starting to forget. We need to actually press the button now in order for the citizens at home to hear us. I you don't apologize. Have to hold the oh. You don't have to hold the button, no. Okay. <laughs> it's not like the legislature. So I just want to, because I keep forgetting when I make a motion or whatever, but we, if you're going to speak, then we absolutely, these aren't automatic anymore. I just wanted to make that clarification. Can you hear the back? Yeah. Yeah, it's not yet. I don't think any. Is that my phone working either? No. When we hold it, it's not amplified either. So it used to be. But didn't it used to? This isn't working either. Hmm. But it used to. Just use your. I'll see if they can do it. Yeah, you, you, use your your deep voice for all of us. Project. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so let's see. This item is coming before you actually as a recommendation from the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, this is an item they looked at at their April meeting um, and provided favorable, favorable recommendation to town council to consider um, enabling campus directional signage uh, to be utilized within the Crossroads Plan Development District. Um, the Crossroads Plan Development District is essentially the Scarborough Downs property that really encompasses the majority uh, of that property. Um, so the stated purpose of campus directional signs are to assist the public in finding specific business locations or destinations within a development. Um, so it's really uh, intended to provide for coordination of signage and wayfinding throughout large developments within our community. Um, so the campus directional sign signs are um, currently allowed for in every other commercial district that would allow for a multifaceted development um, and it appears you know in looking sort of through the documentation of when the crossroads plan development district was approved which really requires a coordinated approach to all other aspects of the development that this was probably just an oversight 
Um, but the Long Range Planning Committee, as I said, did give that due consideration um, and uh, is now recommending that the Crossroads Plan Development District be added as one of the, uh, another district which is allowed to uh, take advantage of the provisions for campus directional signage. So that is my intro. Thank Hopefully you. it was loud enough. Do any, do any councilor members have questions for Jay? No. No? So with that, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Does anybody have any public comment or comments on this, this order? I guess seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion, comments from anyone? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is order number 19032, first reading and refer to the planning board, the proposed amendment to chapter 405B, the site plan review ordinance, section 3B, site plan application procedures and action. And uh, it looks like you're back. So <laughs> you've got, you're I'm, cued, I'm queued up and ready. You're queued up and I like that. That's good. Sure. So, um, Let's see, so this is actually an item that's coming to you through the Ordinance Committee. Um, again, staff was requested uh, by the Ordinance Committee to look at um, provisions in our site plan review ordinance to see if there's a way we can make modifications to enable for better um, engagement with the public and public notification of site plan applications. Just by quick background, site plan, our site plan review ordinance is the ordinance that applies to predominantly commercial development or large multifamily, I shouldn't say large, anything more than three units, multifamily type developments. Um, and so currently the site plan review ordinance does not have any provisions for direct no uh, a butter notification. Of course our agendas are posted online and in town hall, but there seems to be a recognition that maybe there's, there's more we could do. Um, so, again, look, working with the Ordinance Committee, staff looked at some of our other ordinances, including our subdivision ordinance, where our Board of Appeals uh, process is, as well as what some surrounding communities do, um, as well as our current practices and processes. And the proposed language before you would embed language into our site plan review ordinance that would require notification to abutters within 500 feet of any application that comes in uh, for the site plan review under the site plan review ordinance process and that notification will go out at a minimum of 10 business uh, 10 days prior to the meeting so that is the language that's presented thank you does any counselors have any questions comments no? is there anybody in the public that would like to speak to this issue Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Yes, thank you. Next item on the agenda is order number 19034, first reading and schedule a second reading on the bond order for the municipal and school capital improvement projects of the town of Scarborough. And I guess this would be yours, Tom. Well, I oh, did I miss over one? I missed one? Yep. I apologize. No worries. No, we didn't. 33. 33, last one. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Order number 19033. Oh, sorry. First reading and schedule a public sorry. hearing on the proposed Amendments to Chapter 601, the Traffic Ordinance, Section 2, Higgins Beach, and Section, what is that, 4 2 Pine Point Co op. And again, this would be, oh, Jay's not here, so no, that's you. It's that's me. you this year. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, this came before the Ordinance Committee. Uh, um, it's gone back for a couple of minor revisions. Again, it's the ongoing traffic ordinances. One is um, dealing with Higgins Beach parking. Um, and ticketing uh, after hours and then the uh, other one oops sorry I forget about that is the Pine Point co-op um, and some and designating uh, parking spaces along there I will have an amendment to offer mr. chair when the time comes so anyway it came out of ordinance with uh, you know approval and wanting it to yeah. If I could just add a little more history, uh, last season I administered a, a couple of policies and this intends to codify uh, and allow for parking enforcement at Higgins Beach parking lot and also at the Pine Point Co-op 
we've had a couple of, uh, well, historically at the, at the at Higgins Beach, we've had folks that come in early in the morning before our staff arrives and also stay uh, or come after, um, after hours, after our staff has left. So this will allow us to, uh, with the assistance of the police department, do better enforcement. And then at the co-op, for the first time ever, we're um, going to be instituting some uh, designated spaces for commercial fishermen and, and the like. We also, through the cooperation of the police department, I think you heard a bit at the budget review, um, they'll be providing uh, better on-site oversight and enforcement. And again, this will allow them to enforce. So those two matters are somewhat time sensitive as we enter the summer season. We expect that activity to pick up. So with that, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this? Seeing none, is there a motion to? Yeah, I have a motion to amend. Um, I would need to move. Need to move. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm the, so move. <laughs> um, so is there any discussion on the main motions or comments? I have, okay, go ahead. I have a motion to amend. <laughs> yes, but we need, we need to approve We're gonna, the button. We need a motion. a motion. They already have a yeah, motion. Yeah. Now they can make a motion. Oh, to it's in order. order. I have a, I have a motion to amend. I yeah, I was going to say I'm in order. Well, that's what <laughs> we're right. waiting yeah. for. I'm like, what is she looking at me for? <laughs> oh, I just see you down there. Anyway, um, I move that we amend uh, section Roman numeral four two fine point co-op subsection three uh, strike everything after recreational drop off. In other words, strike the words and commercial wholesale buyers. The reason for striking this is we got an attorney's, our a town attorney's opinion that to leave commercial wholesale buyers into this section um, conflicts with the lease that we have with the Pine Point Co-op. Mm -hmm. So, is that the motion to amend? That's my motion. Second. Um, discussion. Yes, I'd, I'd like to speak to this. Um, when this came forward, I think the uh, the striking of the commercial wholesale buyers language was was put forward by uh, I think the town um, and as part of that discussion um, there was a commitment I thought we had to um, review this with the uh, Coastal Harbors Committee and at this point in time I'm not aware if that happened or not um, you know, this is so that's the that's my question I don't really have a uh, you know any change to the proposed motion but that is something I wanted to clarify and and uh, people may recall there's been a fair amount of discussion of, uh, about this so and I just thought it was a uh, it, it happened that this last minute revision happened after uh, this uh, these changes had been proposed several weeks ago so um, it, from a pr process standpoint it just seemed to me that we have an open switch yeah, um, I can address that. Um, if you may recall, um, at, in the ordinance meeting, I believe it was Councilor Foley brought up, she had a question whether this commercial wholesale buyers was uh, in conflict with that lease, and Larissa went back and got um, an opinion that it is. Now, we do plan to bring it to the Coastal Harbors on May 14th. Um, to discuss it with them, and then the plan is for it to come back here on May 15th uh, for second reading and approval. So okay. that's the plan. There should be a public hearing on the 15th. Oh, the hearings yeah. on the 15th, sorry. Councilor Foley? Um, yeah, no, I appreciate Councilor Katarina following up and getting that legal answer, uh, legal question answered. Um, I'm fine with supporting this moving forward, uh, knowing that that. To Councillor Hamill's point, those conversations will still happen because um, this is just, you know, the first reading. But this doesn't really matter, right? It's negligent now because this it's, is the first it's cause, Well, well, it's also it, it's in conflict, so it's struck. So I think that was the the concern. So I'm not. I guess I'm not tracking with the concern, but uh, that's okay. well. It's just a. <laughs> I'm uh, not opposed to the process as outlined. The, uh, the question that I have is uh, we're referring to documents that really have, have not been posted. The final documents that we voted on, uh, uh, 
the actual uh, amended lease agreement um, as well as uh, uh, the original lease agreement that the, the amendment is based on, um, I think it would be helpful if those could be made public and attached to this material as well so that when people are reading this, they can follow it all the way through and understand completely uh, the changes that were made and how, how uh, this, this may affect that. So again, I don't think I'm uh, digging up stuff that's already been covered um, but you know, for my own edification and clarity, and I'm sure we're going to have uh, opportunity, ample opportunity to discuss uh, similar issues and questions along the way. I'd like to ask that that be done. I don't know what form that needs to come in, but um, I would I would feel comfortable if we uh, more comfortable if we did that. In time, you can see to that those documents had they had to be available, weren't they, when we? They certainly were as, as a product of your yeah, approval yeah. process. The documents have now been recorded. I do have the recorded copies here. Uh, it, it's not customary for us to post, you know, kind of documents with private parties, but uh, we, we certainly could if that would serve a public purpose. Well, I, I felt when we were talking about this that there was so much focus on this, and I understand they are documents between private parties that nonetheless, I believe they are in the public domain. And even though there are hard copies available and there's still an open issue related to something that was recently agreed, uh, I, don't, I would hope that it would not be too much of a burden for the town uh, to make those available online someplace or to post them, at least going forward, post them uh, in the fashion that this additional memo from, uh, from the town uh, was, was posted. Yeah, it's certainly not a burden. It's just a matter of where it resides, so it makes it's in proper context. If it makes sense to have it uh, along with these documents, um, that, that's certainly easy enough to do. Yeah, I, I uh, don't have a strong opinion on the repository and where they should lie uh, for future generations to study. But for now, as long as this is still open and it hasn't been put to bed, I think it would be useful uh, prior to this being voted on, uh, as suggested in the in the revised uh, motion. That we should, uh, we should try to do that. And I guess I just had a question for clarity. I, the way that it reads, I, I, I understand that if the parties are in compliance with sections three A and three B, this activity would not be allowed. However, we did talk about, I think, that if they're not in compliance with that that this could be an allowed activity. So I don't know how we address that as we go forward in the conversation. So I think in the spirit of this, if I understand right, if we approve this as a first read, it will go back to Coastal, yes. coastal Waters. They'll have a chance to, to dive into the information. Mm -hmm. It will come forward in a public hearing, and then we will mm -hmm. move on. And I think I'm comfortable with that process, especially <coughs> with Coastal Waters. Yeah. How about anybody, anybody else have any thoughts, questions? So now we're at to approve the motion as amended. Or on amendment. We're on the amendment. No, on the amendment. amendment. Approve the amendment. Approve the amendment, yes. yes. So all those in favor? That's, that's unanimous. So going back to the main motion as amended. Any other comments on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? So I think that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, now we get to order number 19034. First, I, I, just put, I just spared you, Tom, for yeah, a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> First reading is scheduled second reading on the bond order for the municipal and school capital improvement projects of the town of Scarborough. And this is an annual process we do go through. So, Tom, whatever yes. you'd like us to know. Yeah, as you'll note, uh, we do list out uh, the specific capital projects that we do intend to bond. Uh, some of them are in prior fiscal years. We're just now getting around to the need of, of financing. Uh, so I think there's appropriate clarity as to uh, what makes up the, the total bond issue. I did want to speak uh, specifically to the public safety building. Uh, the, this council authorized uh, borrowing $15 million last year, and that was probably 75% of the total voter approval. Uh, we have some IRS and SEC rules in terms of you don't want to borrow money too early to avoid arbitrage and the like. Uh, this next piece uh, doesn't actually complete it. Uh, and uh, we had a resident actually uh, raise some questions appropriately today about mm -hmm. some of our experience with the Wentworth project, where we ended up actually borrowing more money than was necessary to fund the project. And we're in the predicament of, um, 
you know, using those monies for the qualified purpose. So we're doing everything in our power to avoid that. Uh, we expect we'll make the final correction, if you will, this time next year as part of the spring bond issue. We'll know better what all the sources of revenue and, and financing are for the building and what that final need to be bonded is. Um, for those on the finance committee, I do expect to come to you when we have uh, bid results from this bond sale. Uh, if this year tracks like uh, recent years, we expect there will be a bid, bid premium. Uh, we don't ask for it, but it often comes. And there's a decision point to be made as to what to do uh, with mm -hmm. the premium. Um, again, for your recollection, though we had $15 million uh, authority from this council to bond, we only bonded uh, 14, well, last year. Uh, we only bonded uh, $14,265,000 uh, uh, pa this past year because we chose to um, use some bid premium toward that cost. So uh, if it gives, and it should give you comfort, we'll make sure to involve the Finance Committee in those discussion points and decision points. And Tom, can you just speak to, the, again, for those in the audience, these are all things that have been approved in prior budgets and prior processes, and this is yes. just the, the funding of those as we move forward. Exactly right. Thank you for clarifying that. The more, majority of them are within the authority of council through its budget process, but uh, I think the one exception is the public safety building had voter approval yes. associated. Um, I should also mention this is a point of refinement through the budget process. Uh, there is some debt service costs that we need to make sure we're aware of, and we'll be bringing that forward between the town and the school. I think there's a number of ways to manage that, so I don't think it's a, a real killer to the project here or to the whole budget process, but that's a point that we'll touch on um, in your subsequent or future um, budget meetings. Thank you. Does anybody have any comment from the audience on, the, on this issue? <coughs> Seeing none, this isn't usually a real exciting issue. Um, <laughs> um, so with that, is there a, a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any other discussion or questions? Yet? I'd just like to uh, thank the town manager for his uh, uh, very thorough and uh, just-in-time response uh, to yes. a, a uh, uh, query from a <laughs> constituent. From a constituent. So I think this is a it's a good thing that you know we are uh, you know following through and responding to questions like that and trying to do it in a in a way that's constructive and helpful and and hopefully will be. Uh, viewed in a very transparent fashion and also help to educate the public on how it works. And also, I think the fact that uh, the town manager is adjusted in terms of how we're going to try to fund things going forward uh, is also very positive. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'd echo that. Thank, thank you. Tom. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Mm -hmm. um, with that, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, thank you. you. Next order is 19.035, act on the request to sign the warrant for the Special Municipal Election Schedule for Tuesday, June 11th, 2019 at the Scarborough High School Alumni Gym. Appoint the warden. The warden clerk set the hours for voter registration and act on appointments of election clerks pursuant to Chapter 200, Section 8, nomination and elections and authorize the town clerk to make any additional adjustments as necessary. Tony, this is just a housekeeping item to some That's degree. That's correct, it's yes. We had uh, six individuals who picked up nomination papers, two returned <coughs> theirs. They qualified, they gathered the uh, right number of signatures, and those candidates will be John Cloutier and Jessica Holbrook. And they will appear on the, they do appear on the warrant. Thank you. Welcome. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this issue? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion, comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? I, I, I have. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. <laughs> Just a real quick comment, and um, there is um, an item on the warrant that I want people to make sure they understand, and that is the referendum question number one, which is favoring a plan for the school department to join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center. Uh, folks, this is money that the state will give us um, for joining an alliance that helps us save money. Um, so hopefully people will vote yes on this, otherwise we're leaving money on the table. I want to say it's like $83,000. Yeah, it's so, and it's in the budget. Yeah, it's, so, it's the budget. Yeah, so please just make sure you vote. 
for that? I'm going to make a plug for it. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the uh, organization is group purchasing uh, at the school level. So, uh, uh, and uh, $83,000 is included in the present budget so that turning this down would uh, leave us short 83000 mm -hmm. And I guess I'll just pile on and say, I mean, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that yeah. we consider this. It is group purchasing. It's a way that we can get some of the supplies that we need at, at a better rate. There's, it seems to make a lot of sense. Councilor Fuller? Comment on anything, I guess, and, or request. Um, can we have, you asked me in the past where you know, you'll take uh, what's actually going to be um, the language on the ballot and put it on our Facebook page so people, and you give a quick explanation and ask Larissa to do that so that mm. people can yeah. have a clear understanding. understanding. Because the other thing I find with those kinds of posts is that then it's easy, like, easy to share it. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be one Good way idea. To Get the word out. That's great. Anything else? No. So I think we're back to <laughs> voting on on the order. All those in favor? So I think that's unanimous. The last item is number 19036, Act 19036, an act on the request from a tax collector for an abatement of taxes on property located at 29 Matthews Way, Matt T003, lot 29. Yes. Yeah, this is a, a bit of a strange uh, one. The uh, tax assessor, excuse me, the uh, yeah, the tax assessor has the ability of abating um, taxes up to three years uh, in the past. Anything prior to that requires council uh, authorization. In this particular circumstance, uh, we were provided incorrect information regarding a homestead exemption, uh, which was in fact uh, should have been uh, applied. There's obviously a uh, tax consequence to that, so this would actually. Uh, authorize the abatement of taxes for four different tax years. The other years would be taken uh, care of by the assessor. So the total uh, of abatement would be seven hundred twenty-two dollars and seventy-two cents. Thank you. Um, would anybody like to comment on this item? Seeing none. Um, any motion to approve? So moved. Second. Um, any discussion, comments, questions for the town manager or others? Oops. Good correction. Well, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think that this is, you know, a mistake was made, and this is the way to correct it, and I'm all for this. So. Great. Anybody else? Seeing none, all those in favor? So it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, next item on the agenda is item 9, standing, well, non-action items. There are none this evening. Item 9 is standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. And Councillor Babine, we'll start, if that's okay with you on that end. Mr. Hicks, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, Mr. through the chair. Uh, Councilor Babine, there is a budget meeting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. also at, in council chambers. Just Thank you. So you know. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the communication committee uh, meets this Monday at 415. I believe that's going to be in the uh, manager's conference room due to uh, space restrictions. I did want to mention as chair of the committee, I have put on the agenda um, a review of the internal communication that happened before the April 10th um, budget vote. Um, I'm not interested in getting into like the nuts and bolts of who said what or what, but I do believe that we, I, we've tried to publicly acknowledge or I have or, and several of my fellow counselors have acknowledged that that was not executed uh, very well. And I think one of the things that we are charged with as a committee is to um, sit back and, and look at that communication and how it could have been improved. Um, again, not looking to rehash things, so to speak, but just looking at it objectively and saying, you know, hey, what could we have done better? Uh, and I wanted to say that publicly because if you are a member of the public and you want to join us, by all means, uh, it's a small room, but if there's a couple of you that want to sit at the table around with us and hear the conversation, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, 
Liaison reports, the BOE has the superintendent search has now become, I believe, a one-year interim superintendent search. Uh, that was changed, I, be I believe, publicly. It went out Monday or last Friday. Uh, and from my understanding, and I'm, I'm kind of speaking just from my own understanding, is that's a separate process. That process is a little less involved. Um, the Obviously, the job description is a little is narrower, so to speak, and it is for people that are interested in just doing a one-year position. Um, Chamber of Commerce report. I haven't touched base with Art Dillon, but I will say uh, I did watch the planning board meeting on Monday night in its entirety, and Art Dillon did represent the Chamber of Commerce in their support for the Piper Shores project uh, on Monday night. So I think he'd be okay with me uh, reiterating that today um, as the liaison to the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Ordinance was the only committee that I'm on that met in, since our last meeting, and I'll let the chair speak to. Uh, we actually handled a lot of our ordinance meeting <laughs> business tonight, so I think that kind of speaks for itself. I do want to thank Councillor Johnson because I, I like the idea of having that conversation, and I think it's important. Um, so yeah, moving on. What's your um, yes, long range planning will be meeting on. Friday the 10th. Um, ordinance, we are changing our meeting uh, by a week be um, to, because of uh, uh, some schedule conflicts with some of the other counselors. We'll be on the 23rd. Uh, as Councilor Foley mentioned, we had a pretty full plate last ordinance meeting. Our big thing right now is marijuana ordinances and what are we going to do with marijuana? And the state keeps changing things so uh, we're I am going to be meeting with um, assistant town manager Crockett and the assistant town manager from South Portland um, next week I think it is just to find out what South Portland's been doing uh, he said he, he happens to be a citizen of Scarborough so he said he'd come in and, and chat um, and some of the things we looked at um, plastic bag food truck sales um, and so it'll be ongoing conversations on those. Uh, the other thing that I've been real involved with is the Legislative Policy Committee of Maine Municipal. You may have seen my lovely picture in the recent Maine Townsman um, for the municipal revenue sharing. There were 30 town managers, select persons and whatever, who went out and spoke to a joint uh, meeting of appropriations and taxation. I have talked to a few members of the taxation committee um, whom I know personally as well as appropriations but uh, the taxation committee is working on won't be for this session maybe next time around they're going to try to make big improvements on the homestead main revenue sharing and even the income tax potentially looking at um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Governor Mills uh, has put in 2.5% for municipal revenue sharing. She got a huge pushback from taxation and some members of appropriations that they don't think it's enough. Um, and Councilor Babine may know more than I do at this point. Of course, they do all this at the last minute, which will be the week of June, what, June 19th, the statutory uh, adjournment date. Um, there is a chance we may get some more municipal revenue sharing money, which would be nice. So keep your fingers crossed. That would be helpful. How much is a bill for every 1%? $440,000 for each 1% of change. So that could be a significant amount of money for every amount, even if it's a half a percent or more. <coughs> so anyway, that's my report. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, is there a wait and see with the plastic bag since the getting taken up in the legislature later, you know, yes. Are we, are we in a holding pattern for that because of the action that might be through the state? Mm. And it just came up to yeah. us finally from yeah. co conservation and we're going to have an ongoing discussion. Me personally, I want to see what the state's doing also yeah. because why reinvent the wheel right. Right. if you don't have to, so. Okay. That's a good point. Pest Management uh, Committee met this week. This is the uh, committee that oversees the town's herbicide and pesticide policy. Uh, the discussion uh, this particular week, uh, pretty much, pardon the pun, but got down into the weeds. Uh, 
uh, and was uh, uh, a lot about uh, uh, grub management and crabgrass management, which are the two uh, big problems for uh, turf, uh, for managing turf. Uh, 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 there'll be some recommendations, uh, uh, or there'll be a report made by uh, Todd Souza to the town manager to uh, determine whether or not any um, exemptions would be requested uh, for treatment of uh, grubs. Uh, there was certainly some uh, expression of frustration by a number of the members about how, just how slow organic solutions are becoming available. And that is frustrating for people who perceive herbicides and pesticides <coughs> as being a real problem uh, uh, in every community in America and worldwide. So uh, uh, we'll be getting a report from them. They've tried to get on our schedule, but we have had so many uh, workshops that it'll probably be this summer before we get there. Uh, the uh, uh, Sustainability Committee also met last week. Uh, they have a new name. They're no longer the Energy Committee. And it really is a clear expression of their mission, uh, which is broader than just energy. Uh, <coughs> Uh, highlights from that were that uh, uh, we all were advised that the town transfer station space is privately owned and is going to be repurposed. Uh, and while it won't be going away tomorrow or the next day, in the next year or two, uh, that issue will have to be dealt with by the town. Uh, uh, it was reported also that Efficiency Maine is doing grants for charging stations. Uh, and those can be both public and private applications to Efficiency Maine. Uh, it was referenced that certainly the uh, public parking lots at uh, Pine Point and Higgins Beach might be appropriate because we have a lot of people who are traveling considerable distances to those destination spots. Uh, uh, it was also noted that there was an upgrade in the traffic signalization at Dunstan Corner, uh, uh, and it was interesting to hear the description of it because it is a smart lighting system uh, which is intended uh, primarily to have traffic get through the intersections of that very difficult stretch that we're all familiar with. Uh, and it was interesting that uh, a big part of it is to reduce carbon emissions to be able to keep the cars moving and not having them just sit there. It isn't just the convenience of the public, uh, but also uh, a, an environmental issue, and I thought that was interesting. That's great. Quick, quick, quick question, Councilor, um, when you were talking about pest management, you, you talked about the report. Is that the report this summer where we're looking at just the cost effectiveness of organic? Is, it, is, that, is that what you're yes. referencing that we've talked about? Exactly. That and I think the whole history of uh, the seven years that it's been in yeah. existence. That's great. So you think summer, summer, early summer? Yeah. I think as soon as uh, something ready. becomes they're available. Oh, we're, yeah. they're ready. It's just us. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Okay. It's just the town council has been loaded with uh, obligations that have preceded it. That's great. Thank you. Council Hamilton. Yeah, a couple of updates. Uh, uh, the appointments and negotiations committee will meet on uh, the 13th of May. We pushed back a week because of conflicts due to uh, some finance committee meetings. Uh, the only other update I had is uh, I wanted to do a quick shout out to the planning board and the planning department. You know, they've really uh, been carrying a heavy load and will continue to carry a heavy load uh, for the indefinite future, dealing with a whole host of issues that uh, are, are gonna require their continued uh, expertise. Um, I know they met as a group uh, earlier this week to try to refine their approach or try to refocus uh, the board on holding forth on technical issues uh, and to leaving the other decisions to, you know, to the town council. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think these are, are, are tough issues to balance. There's uh, usually somebody who's, who's got some issue of some kind and we're going to hear from them. But I think they've done a really good job of trying to educate the, the public on the challenges and the, the 
the nature of the decisions that are made and how how the town will strive and the board will strive to make good decisions so um, I think you know we need to continue uh, our support of them and recognize their good work and uh, also thank them for the work that they've been doing recently on moving through some ordinance committee changes that I think will make the process easier for all and also uh, more open and transparent for the public so uh, I guess the next item on the agenda is item 11, with, uh, item 10, which is a town manager's report. Yes, a couple points of interest. I'm pleased to report the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Uh, I've been uh, actively involved for my whole tenure, so over 10 years. Uh, a great dedicated bunch of folks dealing with a, a real difficult issue to try to advance that. Um, really spurred on by a lot of private development that's coming forward. Um, in recent years, it, it started in the rental multifamily area. And we're pleased that we have some uh, affordable units online. We, we work with the development community to really come up with systems and processes to make sure that it was easy to administer so we could make sure and track going forward that uh, our goals are being achieved. More recently, uh, we're moving into the single family home uh, arena, really driven by Scarborough Downs and their inclusionary zoning aspects. Uh, and so we needed to come up with uh, the sort of legal mechanisms and interest instruments that will assure that these units will in fact be affordable uh, into the future. Sounds like an easy thing, but I can tell you coming up with legal documents that are um, not toxic to the lending community, that mm -hmm. are understandable to the initial buyer, but subsequent buyers, and frankly, understandable to staff. Someone in town hall will be called when a title search uh, shows, comes up with this restriction on the property. And so I'm really proud of the work that the Alliance has done. Um, I'm pleased to share, and I will share, uh, an annotated copy with you that has uh, some uh, commentary that goes along with it. But it's a fairly dense legal document, uh, but vitally important for us to make sure that our policy goals are met in the first instance and, more importantly, into the future. Uh, Scarborough Downs has had some exciting announcements lately. I was quoted in a press release uh, last week. Uh, they have um, seemingly forged a, a partnership, or at least an alliance, with a commercial sports group, I'll call them, Edge Spor Sports Group. Uh, this group, uh, you can look at them online. They have a, a, a fairly impressive track record elsewhere in New England. Uh, they've done some pretty exciting stuff. The next step is for them to do a detailed feasibility study, uh -huh. and I expect uh, the town will be uh, intimately involved in that process. At this point, I'm not exactly sure how the town fits into that uh, that equation, uh, if at all, and I think those things will be better known as they start to unfold and understand what the opportunities are for them and what the needs are in the community. I can tell you in conversations with the folks at Scarborough Downs, uh, they're all about complementing what we do as opposed to competing with what we do and, and really enhancing. And so I'm excited about the prospects in that regard, and I expect many of you at this table will be involved in one way or another in that process. I know there was interest in the part of some councillors to maybe have a workshop on that matter, and uh, that's something I can look into. Uh, at this point, I don't have much to offer that workshop, but uh, perhaps they'll be willing to come. We could also get a general update on Scarborough Downs at the same time, so I'll work with the council chair on that. Uh, just a thought came to mind. Uh, would it behoove us to reach out to the Scarborough Community Chamber to see if they would host a candidate's night? We do have two candidates. If that's yeah, of interest, uh, we'll make those overtures and see if we can arrange that. I think we have ample time to coordinate that. Yeah. Uh, Toady Beach Passes are now available, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So our foot traffic uh, in the clerk's office will pick up considerably <laughs> over the next few months, uh, I suspect. And don't last forget, thing... Don't forget the free beach passes for people uh, sir, 60 and over. Free beach passes for <laughs> seniors six, 60 and over. Um, and counselors? No. no. Well, Sorry. Well, Only those 60 and over. Yeah. 60 and over. So we yeah. <laughs> And for the benefit of counselors and hopefully the public as well, there's a couple of housekeeping things. I just want to make sure we are, we're all tracking on our schedules. Um, I've, in coordination with the council chair, we'd like to hold an executive session uh, this coming Monday, May 6th at 7 p.m. You all will be assembled for a joint meeting with the Board of Education on finance uh, budget issues. This would be an opportunity for you to meet with legal counsel regarding uh, the tax exemption issue uh, regarding Piper, Sh Piper Shores, and I think it's, it's really imperative that you uh, have firsthand appreciation for 
um, the intricacies of that case as we move forward. And so um, technically it'll be a special meeting that you'll gavel in following the budget meeting, uh, then immediately adjourn to executive session. Um, beyond that, uh, there's a, a number of workshop topics that uh, we'll be working to coordinate over the next coming weeks and months. They include uh, potentially Scarborough Downs, uh, the pest management report. Um, I'd like to address the council uh, regarding the sale of public safety buildings, some of our challenges and maybe opportunities in that regard. And then a, a really large issue uh, related to growth. And I think this is probably a multi-part conversation, but uh, it's a, in my mind, it's important to start that and kind of ground it in uh, really looking at the data where we've been uh, probably statistically driven conversation to make sure that we're assigning things properly. Um, case in point, I've heard a lot of, uh, a number of folks reference multifamily being uh, one of the challenges to school enrollment. And based on my analysis, that's not the case. So I think it's important that we all mm -hmm. have a, a standard uh, basic set of facts really to start that conversation, which um, could be lengthy, I suspect. And lastly, just a reminder for you all, the Scarborough Community Chamber will be doing its municipal officials dinner. This has been rescheduled, and it's now May 22 at Atria. We can send out a reminder if that helps yeah. you as well. Yeah. Yes, we'll do that in the morning. With that, <coughs> that's it. Thank you. So I guess the next item is item 11, um, councilor member comments. And this time we'll start Councilor Hamill. I don't know if you'd like to share anything this evening. Uh, yes, one thing I forgot to mention uh, in updating on the planning board is I wanted to thank the leadership uh, displayed by Nick McGee. Okay, he really did a great job of taking some new rules and applying them and, uh, you know, helping his team to decide tough stuff and to defer some larger questions, and mainly as it referred to the, the site plan and uh, uh, related to the Piper Shores expansion. Thank you. Uh, on the budget, uh, uh, the process change uh, did create some anxiety, uh, but I think we all urge at this point that we all work in good faith together in a cooperative manner and a spirit of cooperation to uh, find solutions. I strongly feel that school budget's an excellent budget, so, but. Uh, uh, I think a fair, honest, open debate about it, uh, it should be able to withstand any uh, criticism. And uh, I look forward to working with everyone on the council uh, in the final two weeks that we have to get this thing uh, done well for the town. Um, yeah, I would just um, go off from that budget. Um, Again, just a reminder, tomorrow at 10 in the morning, for folks who are around, we will be having a budget question um, and answer um, session at 10 a.m. here. Um, I was a little disappointed that there weren't more people here to speak to the budget. I don't know what that means, per se. I haven't been hearing a lot on email or phone calls either, so that, maybe that's a good sign. Um, but I just remind people that your voice is important and we want to hear from you. I particularly am interested in hearing not so much, oh, cut or save. I want to know specifics about what do you really like about the types of investments the school wants to do or what the town's doing or places you think it might make sense to make some changes rather than just these blanket statements. That, that to me, is a little more helpful. Um, and then regarding this uh, sports group coming to Scarborough Downs, I'm very interested in hearing more about that. So I look forward to uh, exactly what that means uh, for the town. Uh, I think it's they, they seem to be moving along and doing a lot of, you know, getting their development going. I drove through there the other day um, with my husband, and my husband was amazed how much construction's going on and how they're really working to get some of those phases done, so that, that's a good thing. That's it. Great, thank you. Councilor Fuller. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. One, this weekend, I think we just have to get on the Saturday. Let us know if it's not a new spike day. It's now, I think, the third year. Um, hosted by Ohio School. 
paper. Oh, sorry. I'm never going to remember that. I gotcha. <laughs> um, I want to thank Councillor Hamill for putting together his uh, Councillor's Corner article and encourage everybody to be thinking about what they want to submit with their beautiful picture on there uh, and their article. My mom and, liked it. And uh, what's that? <laughs> My mom liked it. It was very nice. <laughs> you did a good job. And then you included all of us, so we feel we're grateful for that. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then, um, last but not least, uh, plovers are here in droves. I, I've heard, and Councilor Donovan is down there, so he may know, I heard they had found 14 so already, which is early and a lot. Um, so be aware um, of, uh, of the little cuties and their desire to be nesting on our beaches and watching the rules. So When I was down in South Carolina, I was recruiting them to come up. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I may, I was on the beach today and observed uh, uh, two nests, three other couples uh, uh, who will be nesting soon. Uh, this was at Higgins. Uh, and one nest had four eggs and the other had two. Uh, and I got a report from a friend uh, down at uh, Ferry Beach that it's very active. Yeah. Wow. Uh, at Ferry Beach this year. Very active. So, good start. Uh, Let's hope for no high tides and big moves. And the, the beach sand has shifted, continues to shift towards the Spurwink River. Uh, so there is more uh, dune area uh, in, the, in the area where the birds nest. So, it's a p p positive. Uh, so just to echo what uh, Councillor Foley said about Council's Corner, uh, we'd love to have a couple more councillors. We can't let Don and I be the only ones getting humanized in these things, right? <laughs> <laughs> Impossible oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, just a quick story that happened. Uh, this afternoon, uh, Councillor Don and I had tea at Fo Hung Restaurant, which is right, right there. You can throw a rock to it. It's Vietnamese cuisine. Um, it's a great little spot. But it was, I thought, we experienced something that I thought was very telling. Uh, as we were sitting there, a teacher from Scarborough High School came up to say hello. Uh, and Bill introduced himself and we chatted and uh, she had mentioned that she wanted to come and speak in uh, support of the school budget tonight and I encouraged her to come out. And she hem and hawed, or maybe it was he, who knows who it was. Uh, and she goes, well, I can't, I can't do that because, you know, my parents would never forgive me because they vote down the budget every year because uh, they're on 27 acres. And I just thought that was very telling of where limited we are. And yeah. Limited. yeah, 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 in limited income. And she said, it, I mean, it was all a very good conversation, but I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm personally, and I think everybody here is personally committed to do right by, by everyone. And I just thought it was, a, it was a great experience of me and Don having some tea. I'm sorry, not Don, I'm sorry, Bill. Me and Bill having some tea. And it just, the, the town walked in, essentially, in, in that little interaction. It just said a, a whole lot. So, um, yeah. Thank you. That's where we
so it was Well, thank you. Um, and with that, I guess we'll motion to adjourn this evening. So moved. Uh, thank you, everyone. No, all those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh,